Dr. Bratcher, thanks so much for joining us here again on Health Connection. Always a pleasure. Thank Our you. topic, testosterone. Is it helping or hurting? The truth about low T. And the first question is, low testosterone, low T as it's called in the media, become a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States. Why? I think there's many reasons for that. Um, some are good and some are bad. One is that we have better testing, although our testing is still not perfect. Um, we have a lot of products that are available that don't uh, require men to use injections. Of course, we have Big Pharma that makes products and wants to sell things, so they do direct-to-consumer advertising. I think that's brought the awareness up, which is good, but then it may stimulate people to uh, ask about it that may not need it. Um, I think it's human nature. People want to feel better and um, look better. So there are a lot of longevity or wellness or anti-aging clinics that um, kind of promote testosterone as, as um, a fix for some of these things. We obviously have an aging population of baby boomers and people want to keep feeling well, which is, which is understandable. What's the role of testosterone in a man's body and why is, is it important? And if so, why is it important to monitor levels? Well, of course, it's extremely important. It's what takes the boy and makes him a man um, at puberty. And then it's responsible for um, uh, body hair and facial hair. Um, ironically, it causes actually baldness. Um, also, bone strength, red blood cell production, fertility, and the ability to procreate. Um, as well as muscle mass strength and probably mood and emotions. As we age, why is it important to monitor levels? Well, there really is this concept of menopause or andropause, and it is a real thing. It's just, uh, levels start declining at about age 30 to 40. It's just that it's so much more gradual than, say, like a female menopause that's very abrupt. So the average man probably doesn't need to have it tested but it, if you have signs and symptoms and something sounds suspicious that it might be low, then it is appropriate to test. So you don't check just anybody, but if you're on therapy, then it's absolutely critical to monitor the levels and have the right amount. Testosterone levels dropping, a sign of aging, you know, brought about by aging, but are there any other things that would cause levels to drop that could cause health problems? Yeah, there really are a lot of causes. Um, some people are actually, it's congenital, they're born with it and they require it to um, go through puberty. There's rare things like mumps or chitis, there's pituitary tumors, um, of course is a lot of what I see. There's also um, autoimmune problems that are related to type 1 diabetes and thyroid disease where people can't um, make testosterone. Obesity and the metabolic syndrome is, is highly um, related to low testosterone. Those would be people that are more, you know, low normal or um, don't have quite as much, not severe deficiencies. Some men are receiving testosterone to prevent heart attack and stroke. Others use testosterone to build muscle, restore libido. Are these appropriate uses of testosterone? Well, the answer is they're both. Some, some of it's being used inappropriately and some of it's being used appropriately. So there's a lot of interest and controversy in this topic right now versus uh, with cardiovascular disease. Um, they ha there are many, many studies that show that uh, testosterone replacement reduces mortality and reduces heart disease. But then there's some more recent ones that show that it might lead to more heart disease. And it boils down to what if you're using it appropriately and at the right dosages rather than using it indiscriminately in the wrong patient. And it really kind of parallels what happened in the women's um, hormone replacement movement. You know, it's good, then it's bad, then it's, oh, maybe we need to really weigh the risk and benefits and use it in the most appropriate person. Testosterone levels easily monitored through a blood test, but are there symptoms that somebody might notice that might tell you that your testosterone okay. levels are getting low? Yeah, the symptoms would be uh, less energy. Um, the actual um, sexual desire or libido is much more specific for low testosterone than the ability or performance. Um, but people, uh, men might notice less spontaneous erections. They may have sleep disturbances, some moodiness, um, but uh, an increase in, in girth in the middle, uh, more fat mass than lean mass. 
We get mixed information from the media about testosterone. Some say that, some of the reports say that testosterone replacement helps. Some say it can cause problems, even death. Where in all of that does the truth lie? It's, you know, obviously it's going to be in the middle somewhere. If you use testosterone in the wrong person or you use too much, you can cause problems. Um, there, just as estrogen has, has a risk of thrombotic effects in women, testosterone has been associated with that in men. Um, it makes red blood cells, so you can make your blood too thick, which would obviously be not a good thing for heart or stroke. Um, when there is a decreased libido and there is decreased muscle mass and symptoms and documented clearly low levels, then it could be very appropriate to use it and replace it. I think you just touched on this. There's a large black market in the U.S. for testosterone. It is sold in, in, in some shady places. And men, especially those who are into bodybuilding by the drug illegally, what's the risk of using this drug outside of a physician's supervision? Well, I just call that Russian roulette because there is no way for you to know what's actually in that injectable medicine that you're ordering, let alone that you're getting the dose that you've been told you've been sold. So those can cause um, infertility, sterility, your testes can shrink. Um, the excess testosterone can get worse than sleep apnea. Um, it could cause uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy. Let's say there's an underlying prostate cancer, it could promote growth. I believe most endocrinologists and uh, physicians don't believe that it causes prostate cancer, but it certainly will promote it if it's already there. When we are under a physician's care, when we are replacing testosterone, are we trying to replace it to the levels when we were 20, or are we trying to replace it to the levels that are appropriate for our current age? Appropriate for age. You have it right. Hit the nail on the head. Um, the range is very wide. And te like I said earlier, testing has gotten better, but testing isn't perfect. And then testosterone is, is a fluctuant hormone. It's, it's different at different times of the day. So... We want to do it age appropriate, but the level is so wide that human nature, men see, oh, well, maybe I should get it into the higher range of normal. But in the case of hormones, more is never necessarily better. I mean, it's, it's really easy to understand that with something like insulin. You know if you have too much, you're going to have a problem. And you know if you have too little, you have a problem. Well, it, it's the same way with any hormone, including sex hormones like testosterone. Testosterone replacement comes in more than one form. It's injectable, there are gels. Why the difference in the delivery and should, when should one be used over the other? Well, it turns out to be, unfortunately, dictated a lot by insurance companies. But what we had at the beginning was what we now call short-acting injections. And the most common thing would be that men would get it every two weeks. Well, when you do that, you have a spike a peak and a trough so you have fluctuating levels so it's actually better if you could do a smaller dose weekly then came patches and gels which actually endocrinologists and providers um, prefer because it gives you a much smoother stable level um, however it's it's much more difficult to get an insurance company to pay for um, the gels than it is the, the short-acting injectables now there's also new things called pellets that can be injected give you a nice, stable, long-lasting level. It's pretty underutilized in our country. There's also a new long-acting injection um, for 10 weeks that just got to America, but it's been used in Europe for much longer. But that is also a problem getting insurance to pay for it. What are you talking about insurance? Is this expensive if you're paying out of your pocket? Uh, injectable, the old injectables, like, you know, most commonly depot testosterone is not expensive. All, all other products are extremely expensive. Okay. Outrageously expensive. All right. Commercials you see on TV would have you believe that testosterone is just a magic bullet, and if you start taking it, you'll notice these wonderful things happening in your life. Any truth there? Well, two two things come to mind. If you actually have a low testosterone, it will make you feel better. I have seen things that I would call miraculous on people that have been replaced that truly, truly needed it. The other thing you have is, is a placebo effect, and I'm not discounting the placebo effect. I believe in the placebo effect of a lot of things. But if you think you feel better and your level's a little bit higher, you probably do feel better. So it is not um, the holy grail of you know, aging for males, but it can be substantially um, helpful in the right person. 
Over the counter though, Should, what about that? Uh, over the counter, they're probably not actual testosterone. You can't take testosterone orally because it will um, hurt the liver. Um, so what you're usually taking over the counter are things that try to boost it or maybe prevent um, its aromatization into estrogen, um, which can cause, you know, that's one of the side effects is gynecomastia if you're taking too much um, testosterone. So, but that, but supplements are not regulated, so we have no way of knowing what's in those. If during a physician visit or an annual physical, for example, low tes testosterone is detected, what's the next step? Uh, the next step is always to repeat it because the guidelines really suggest that you should have two readings before you call it because we discuss how it does fluctuate. And we, what we like to do is have people test it in the morning where we can compare it to the ranges. It is usually higher in the morning. So if, I, if you get measured in the afternoon, it might look low, but if you get it measured in the morning, it might not be that abnormal. So you always want to retest it, confirm it, then look for um, probable causes or um, things that might be causing it so that you might be able to fix those things. And then if you have symptoms and you have a low and you discuss the risks and benefits, um, then it might be appropriate to replace it. Very well, doctor, thank you very much. You're welcome.